Welcome to the Creative Play and Podcast Network. Join us as we share our favorite RPGs, one-shot games, tabletop games, reviews, and convention panels. Sit back and enjoy the show. Hi, this is Kelly, a.k.a. Trixie from Ragnarok and Roll, a sign to Ragnarok story, and Tilda Wimblewick from D&D Journey of the Fifth Edition. First off, I would just like to say thank you to everyone for listening to our varied adventures, as well as for rating us on iTunes and RPGpodcast.com. If you haven't rated us yet, we would greatly appreciate it if you could. And if you're looking for more ways to support our efforts, we are now on Patreon, a great site where you can help us continue making more podcasts, as well as some special surprises for our patrons. If you can, please look us up at www.patreon.com slash cppn. Every little bit helps. And again, thank you for listening. Well, hello everyone. Welcome to our panel on... Uh, genre. Yeah, genre. Uh, my name is Sharon Skinner, and I write across genre and across category. Uh, so I write everything from picture book on up, and mainly focus on speculative fiction, which covers a big, broad group of genre. So... Work. Okay, um, I am Marcy Rocco, Marcy Rocco. Um, I also write across genres. Uh, mine mostly are in the fantasy, dark fantasy horror uh, realm, but I have done science fiction, and weird western. Um, I did a lot of poetry, I was a Risling Award winner last year, so. And, um, uh, so, that's me. I'm Jeff Marriott, I'm mostly write as Jeffrey J. Marriott. I've had 70 some novels published, a bunch of comics and graphic novels in almost every genre you can think of. I haven't done romance or, or romanticy, which maybe we'll get to on this panel. Um, but horror, thrillers, mystery, science fiction, fantasy, sword and sorcery. Um, they all comics, etc. So kind of all over the map. And I worked in uh, comics publishing for many years. I own a science fiction, fantasy, horror mystery bookstore called Mysterious Galaxy in San Diego. Mm-hmm. I want to go there. Yeah, that's great. Nice. Yeah. Um, under new management. Still good. under new ownership. I am Diana. I uh, write. I have read my whole life. I love reading almost every genre you can imagine. I, I've read science fiction, fantasy, of course, histories, uh, cozy mysteries, and hard-bitten thrillers, and I like um, country western, and I like um, I like about everything, the classics. Uh, the first set of novels I wrote with a co-writer are post-apocalyptic fiction, which are a favorite of mine. I really enjoy post-apocalyptic fiction, and I see that we're coming into those times now, so I was ready. Um, <laughs> uh, I also have written poetry. I have been published in poetry books. I have been in creative works yet. Yeah, I think I took up poetry to help me with my regular writing, because I wanted to be more concise, and that's helped me write short stories. Um, I also run um, a Facebook page, called Dread Punk Equals Gothic Horror, which is basically a dark humor website, which has, at this date, over 165,000 followers. I don't know how it got to that point, but I'm, I'll take it, you know? But I do uh, interact with my fans, and we have a really, really good time. So I'm here for that, too. I just started a new book that's a fairy tale, and it's about a change thing who has to go back to Ferry. So, we'll see how that plays out. Your issue is exactly the same as my issue. I like to read every genre. Yes. And so when I'm writing, I can't confine myself to one of them. So I, it's hard. I write horror with mystery elements, or, right. or thriller with espionage elements. Right, that makes I, it better. I started with a horror novel this week. What else is going to end up having in it? I don't know yet. Thriller. Um, romance. Yeah. You know, I, I do want to write a, a horror romance. Or, 
a horror with strong romantic elements. That's great. Right. Like, well, that is, that is something that is a motivation. Is when you're caring about someone and you're trying to help them and save them. So, yeah, good work. I've seen it done. Bloody Mary is a good example. Mm -hmm. It happens to be YA, but it's, it's exactly that. Yeah, so for a, a sample, it's a good place to go. I forget the author's name. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, exactly that. We're going to talk about first what is really happening in the world of books when it comes to genre and kind of I think we can all agree that once upon a time there was the book and then it became sliced and diced into so many different varieties uh, flavors and that was all done basically for marketing purposes so that people would know where on the shelf they could find the books that they wanted to read. And now what we're seeing is we're seeing these lovely mashups of all of these sliced and diced things that are being kind of mashed back together in other ways. It's sort of like having a, a box of Legos and throwing them on the floor and then sorting them and then taking them. Here's the blue one, here's the red one. Yeah, and then putting this them back blue together. And red. Yeah, putting back together any old way you want. And it's a lot of fun. I just my I, I had a book come out last year that is called Lost and Found. It's a middle grade novel, but it's a mashup of Peter Pan, Oliver Twist, and Steampunk. It's a novel. That sounds fun. Speaking of mashups, yeah. So. <clears throat> Yeah, we were actually talking about it. Jeff and I were right. We were talking about it on the way down here. On a very, very uh, slow trip. Um, <clears throat> like, it used to be just fantasy. And then there was fantasy. Like, where, where do you go? Paranormal romance and urban fantasy. And you can sit up here if you want. Because Mr. Brand. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I think I'd be intimidated. Okay, I'm intimidated, but that's okay. Because they're all fantasy, and they all have romance, but they all focus on different aspects. Right? So, like, if you were a bookstore owner, and you were trying to shelve two subgenres, like, that would be ridiculous. It would be impossible to do that. So all the fantasy goes under fantasy, and sometimes under science fiction, sometimes under horror. All the science fiction goes under science fiction, and sometimes under fantasy, sometimes under horror, and sometimes under horror. So many years ago, one of my friends said, you've got to read Alan, and it's so good. And I'm like, well, what is it? Well, it's time travel, and she's a doctor, a nurse, and she knows learns how to treat people in the past. And I'm like, wow, that sounds like science fiction. And it was in romance, because there's also romance to it. And so it's like, how do you find what you want? Yeah, you can't anymore. Well, although, although with, um, I actually think it might be easier now because there are those terms out there now. It's urban true. romance, urban fantasy, romanticy, urban dark, diesel punk, whatever, <laughs> solar punk, coke punk, all of those. Like if you could, you put that in under any in any bookstore that you're looking, searching for online, and you're probably going to be able to find something. Well, and I think that's why online you get to see multiple categories. They're, they're usually listed in multiple categories so that it's easier for readers to find. It's really all about the flavor. I was talking uh, earlier to someone about, we were talking about science fiction and one of the books that came up that I really liked and that this person was not especially fond of was uh, Gideon the Ninth, which is science fiction. But it's also goth, and it's also horror. And, and romance it's also, in space. And it's also romance, <laughs> to, to some extent, you know, yeah, and, yeah, so it's, you know, it's all about the flavors that you like, and, and whether or not you like butterscotch on your chocolate ice cream. Right? Well, they've created so many subgenres now that almost anybody can be an Amazon bestseller to define yourself enough. <laughs> <laughs> How many categories do they have on Amazon now? Uh, Six thousand. Yeah, it's a lot, but they don't let you pick. They they pick for you. <coughs> yeah. yeah so. I actually have a funny story about that. My my very first published book was for uh, Wizards of the Coast. Um, it was in the Eberron setting, and it hit number one on Amazon under. Puzzle books. <laughs> <laughs> it's a game. -ish. I, I, I guess. 
<laughs> but see, you're a number one Amazon bestseller writer. I've never, claimed, I've never claimed to be the number one Amazon bestseller. But yeah, but, you're, but your marketing could. I, I could, but could. I feel like that would be a little disingenuous because I, I went to a I dentist disagree. and had a little trophy thing on his counter when you walk in. It's an Amazon number one bestseller because he self published a book on, on TMJ <laughs> back when most dentists wouldn't even admit that it existed. Wow. In a world where um, basically, Politicians have started using WWE marketing tactics. I really think anything goes. <laughs> well, yes, it's not, true. Not, Fair point. It's true. Anything goes. I would say do it. And then when people ask, wow, what was it? It was this great book. Not that long. Because you legitimately plan clean. Okay. Yeah, screenshots. <laughs> All those screenshots can be good. Why is not? I suppose. Yeah, this the other thing about it, it it's so momentary but in, nowadays when for for most of us if we get to that level it's just momentary. You know, I was watching one of my books get up above a hundred and you know and all that. I didn't quite make it to one. Really Unless you're Colleen Hoover and then you stay <laughs> all of your books stay on the New York Times bestseller yeah, there, list there and they just few. and they just stay there. Oh, question from the audience. So when you guys are writing, not necessarily for contract writing, but sort of for yourselves, is genre present in your mind based on what you're writing? Are you thinking about what genre you were writing would fit in? Not me. I'm just writing a story I want to hear. In fact, I'm not thinking about that. I'm thinking about telling the story. And then when I'm done, I'm like, okay, what is this? Where is this going to go? <laughs> Maybe it can be in several places. We'll see. Aren't there, quote, rules that you're supposed to follow for each genre, and if you don't, you don't get the readers? It depends on the commercial genre that you're talking about. So yes, some are very specific, like mystery and romance. They're, they're a little more proscriptive, but you can get away with a lot more in, say, I think, in the fantasy realm, especially if you're mashing it up, because you know, as long as it's fantasy, it can be high fantasy, it can be low fantasy, it can be urban fantasy, it can be, again, you get you get a lot of leeway, a lot more leeway in certain genre than you do in others. Some are just more prescriptive than others, but you're right, there are some that are very, there are certain expectations that you must meet. Um, although, I will say that the people who break the rules and do it really well are the ones who then make a new trend for another genre or sure. to move us in another direction. Well, so. if, and if, some of us break the rules yeah. and don't get the readers. <laughs> but if you don't care, you know, if you get a readership, right? If you get your fans who will buy anything you write, you pretty much can do whatever you want because those people will buy whatever you sell. Oh, but there's almost no such thing as that. Oh, unless you're probably who Okay. Okay, everyone. but I have favorite writers and I buy everything they write because I like their style. There, yes. there are a few, and, and I have a few fans like that, and they'll write, read everything from my middle grade all the way up to my adult. I have adults who read my middle grade books because they like my books and they like me. So yes, there are not enough to make it make me a number one best uh, best seller on Amazon, but enough to make me happy and. So back to the question that was asked earlier about you know focusing on the genre or not. Typically, I don't. Typically, everything I write is character driven, and it's all about you know getting inside those characters and telling a good story. But I will say, when I wrote Lost and Found, which is my mashup of Peter Pan, Oliver Twist, and Steampunk, that was intentional. I wanted to write a steampunk Peter Pan novel, and it just made sense to set it in a setting that was more Oliver Twisty because I needed something dark to work with because I didn't want it to be your standard Peter Pan. So for that one, I was very intentional about what I was mashing up and the genres I was picking. I write the story that I want to write that I, that I can't read because no one else has written it. And I hope it sells. I have a day job and I had a day job for all the years that I've been writing except for six when I went into debt. Um, and I do pay attention to genre, but I also know going in that I'm going to add whatever I want. Because you gonna, write everything. It's going to blend 
and you read different everything. dramas. And that's the thing is, if you read everything, then you see something. Oh, this could be part of the story. It's a mystery that doesn't really fit, but I don't care because it'll be fun. <laughs> now, the the one caveat to that I think is that people who self-publish or do hybrid publishing or even publish with smaller houses. I think we get a little bit more leeway with that because, like, if you're looking for an agent, it, it doesn't matter how great the book is, if they look at it and they say, I can't tell you how many times when I was looking for an agent, I heard, I love this book, I have no idea how to sell it. Well, and then also, I mean, to, to what you all do, um, because you also do a certain amount of uh, work for hire, you your genre is kind of prescriptive for you, yeah. right? I mean, if you're being asked to write a Star Wars book or a Western book, you've got to write, that's what you got to write. More or less. Yeah. <laughs> but I have written a Spider-Man horror novel. Nice. So how in the world do you get a contract for hire? Do you just have a fan who <clears throat> contacts you and says, write me this book? Or um, you can go looking for them, you can meet people in, in publishing, um, sometimes they'll come to your agent. Sometimes you apply for them, right? Sometimes. Mm -hmm. I have who's editing and you get in touch with them and you say, hey, I'd love to take a shot at a, a Buffy novel. That's where I started. Really? That's fun. So you were a Buffy fan when I started? No, I, I had not actually watched the show. <laughs> <laughs> so what, 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 what appealed to you about Buffy? That they came to me and they said they paid me to write a book. So. Oh, oh, gotcha. <laughs> they came to you. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> Did you end up watching the show to see? Yes. Oh, good. Yeah, if, if you're in the Kindle realm, uh, the, the books that are the chapter books and the easy readers, the early readers, those, those series books, typically are all work for hire. Almost no one can goes out and says, oh, I'm just going to write easy readers and I'm going to get an agent. And I'm it doesn't work that way. They want people they know can deliver and can deliver consistently. And they will hire people to do that. So you have, they have to get to know you? Like you they have to, to, well, you either have a track record or they, they know you can, yeah, they know you can fill what they're asking for. Or you're somebody who's already got a track record in the kid-led industry, you've written middle grade novels or you've written you know, other things, they'll come to you and they'll say, I want, I would like you to write this you know, series of early readers. Early readers are a pain though because they have to be, talk about the things that are prescriptive. Oh, when yeah. you're, when, yeah, because you know, early readers, these letters well, certain words, words, yes, words. certain words and you know, yeah. things like that. And, you know, when you get into kid lit, it's it's a lot harder to do than people think. Picture books right. are hard. I mm -hmm. had no idea how to do kid lit. I haven't read. I don't think I ever read kid. People think that picture books are really easy. Picture books are not easy. Picture books are really really hard because you still have to tell a complete story from beginning to end. You have to have compelling characters, and you have to do it in 500 words or less, and leave room for the illustrations to tell the other half of the story. It it, it ain't an easy gig. Yes, sir. So, uh, for those of you that are across genre, do you find that people peg you into a genre and expect that that is the genre that you will each write in? Marcy? <laughs> why, why did you look at me? Well, um, I guess kind of, lately. This book, um, I have written Sisters of Sorcery for Marvel, and it's a book about witches. And I wanted to write more books about witches for Marvel. But then they came to me and they said, hey, we're going to launch a horror line. And we think you'd be perfect for it because you write dark and twisted crap. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, OK, well. I think that's the word you used. Hopefully not. I write dark and twisted crap. I started with that. I like, <laughs> Okay, well, uh, being totally candid, I did not really care for the Marvel Zombies comic arc. I thought it was very bleak. But Marvel comes to you and says, hey, we want you to be the headliner for this new line of horror novels. You don't say no. So I'm like, okay, well, can I at least have witches in it? <laughs> so I got to do my witches anyway. But yeah, I, I kind of got pigeonholed there and 
it was a little bit to my detriment, but I think it was a great opportunity. I'm very grateful for it, don't get me wrong. I just, it, in an ideal world, I would have continued to have written about these characters instead of when, when Marvel came to you and decided to you know, have you write a book, did you start having fantasies of having a Marvel movie? <laughs> <laughs> no, these books are based on the comic books, not oh, the Marvel stuff. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. There's, there's, uh, there's some overlap, but there's surprisingly a lot of divergences. Well, I'm also an eclectic, eclectic and voracious reader and have been all my life and read uh, everything, right? Um, but uh, normally I write fantasy, science fiction, it's, you know, that sort of thing. And it's, it's not dark. It's not twisted for the most part. And uh, my book. You're so twisted. You're so twisted. I know. Because, so last year, at, in October, I had a new book come out called Blood from a Rose, which is short fiction, uh, short stories, fan, uh, flash fiction, and poetry, and it's all very, very, very dark, because one of the things I've found over the years is when I write short, it goes dark very quickly. I can say, oh, I'm going to write about this beautiful rose today, and I end up in a graveyard. <laughs> so I just, yeah, it's where I went. And so for me, I had a lot of readers who were really surprised, you know, by this book, but I love this book, and it takes the reader on a journey from dusk until dawn. It takes us through the darkest of night, but it's also got two demon stories in it that are quite funny, and I never thought I was, uh, I didn't think I could write funny, but apparently people all laugh in the right places in these stories, and they really want more. So um, it's basically two demons right in now. hell living as like the odd couple. Hello, I'm in a panel right now. Yeah. 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 So um, so I, I, I've had a few people who were quite surprised at how I went dark, but it just it's I think that we have it in us. I think that you know it's all part of the fact that we all have dark and light inside of us, and I just needed to get it out of my system. I don't know. But, one of my most republished short stories is uh, not quite why, I guess it would be a little great, um, a story about a magician's apprentice that is partly dark and all. So, yeah, I mean, I, I have it in me to be a little light. <laughs> So what do you guys like to read? Do you like to read cross-genre novels? Yeah. yeah. Favorite mashups. Do we yeah. have any purists in here that will only read one? It's a I only Western, read one I will only read Western I read Westerns. Romance. Western only. No, I, I mostly don't. read science fiction, but um, it will come into my life, the other books. <laughs> People give them to me or I run into them. And, I, and I'll read that. Yeah, so I science read a fiction lot. can have a lot of uh, subgenres too now. Yeah. So I wanted to ask when you're talking about bookstores and Amazon classifying the genre because they want to be able to put it in a notch for selling, what is the result now if there's so much mix up? Are they just throwing their hands up or what's going on? Well, you get, you get uh, fantasy books classified as puzzle books. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but Amazon, I guess, would be easier to do that because it's electronic. But in a bookstore, you have to put it somewhere. Well, going back to Outlander, um, and I've heard uh, Diana Gabaldon say this. She said that um, they didn't know where to shelf her when that book came out, so they I shelved her in multiple places. Yeah. I've seen that. Yeah, I've seen that multiple times. So yeah. priors get shelled in different places. That's well, it probably got it. too popular, so they had to help you find it. <laughs> yeah, I, well, and in, in that was a, a huge mashup. <clears throat> and I think it was, and it was a big, her first book was a big thick poem, and I think she, she had some trouble at first finding an agent that would take it on, but people love it, right? Yeah. People love it. Yeah, so. now it is. But at first it was hard to find, and... Yes, people found it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. So, starting with Diana, 
Uh, talk about when you were writing where you thought you were pretty solid writing in a genre, and then you found an element of maybe another genre that creeped in based on your creative this process. This happens to me. And how did this happen? Like, how did you feel about that? It's a little frustrating because, I mean, I know it's me, okay, but I know that I've created these characters, and I am trying to make them whole characters, whole people. So when I'm writing, it's like I feel, it's, I know it's me, but I feel like it's them steering me in a different direction. Um, I just started a novel, I told you it was a fairy tale, when I first started wanting to write a cozy mystery about some older ladies who get a house in Ireland and all their adventures, and it just totally derailed into something a little darker about a changeling who has to go back to fairy and her sister's like, where did she go? And why do I now have a real twin back? And what's going on? And it's it's gotten darker than my little happy idea. Um, that my friends all said, yes, we'd like to read that. But now they're like, we need to read this. <laughs> so I guess it's good, right? I guess that's good. But yeah, it happens. It just happens. Right? I don't think it sneaks up on me. It's, con it's entirely conscious. My first novel was um, about superheroes published by the comic book company I worked for, Gen 13, Image Comics. Um, and it was a collaboration with a friend of mine who's a horror author. And I had also written some horror comics and short fiction. So we knew going in that we were going to write a horror superhero book, and we did. And then later, as I mentioned, I wrote a horror Spider-Man book, so it's a thing. Um, so I know going in that I'm going to bring in elements from different genres I like. The, the only thing that I would say that is consistent about what I do is that there's always suspense. There's, there's always a, there's usually a ticking clock and there's a, there's a fast pace driving force that pulls us through the story. But other than that, every genre bits and pieces of every genre and every book. Well, for me, in my first book um, was Work for Hire. And when you do Work for Hire, you have to supply um, chapters sometimes and then a very detailed outline. So, so you're good at the outline and following it because yeah. I'm not good at that. <laughs> How did you get to the position where you got a book for hire? I will address that. Just no, I just... <laughs> um, so when I come to a book, I usually have an outline. When I write poetry or even sometimes a short story, um, I will oftentimes outline short stories or at least you know, kind of bullet points. But with poetry, I might start thinking that, oh, this is going to be this, because this is what I want to explore. And then my pretty rose winds up in a graveyard. <laughs> or probably, in my case, it would be my graveyard winds up being a nursery. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Yeah, break that out. So I usually know. I, that's just how I came up into novel writing. So. Well, and again, with me, it's character driven, but I kind of know where the world is for those characters because I know what they want and I know what they need. So, and, and I like writing fantasy and, well, speculative fiction. I like to write fantasy and science fiction and, and su, su, um, super, uh, super uh, paranormal. And, and all of that because I like to write about real things but put an arm's distance between reality and fantasy or the fiction that's on the page so that we can I can deal with real issues but at an arm's length. So not to say that there's not emotion on the page and that it doesn't engage people at an emotional level, but it gives me some distance from the issues that I'm writing about when I'm writing a story. Um, to address your question real quick, um, people come to work for hire a lot of different ways. Um, my first book was way back when Wizards of the Coast was holding open calls. So <coughs> I 
submitted a sample for an open call and it got shortlisted and then a bunch of open calls and then some closed calls and then eventually they got sick of me and gave me a book contract. No, I, I was very curious about how that, that happens. But I had another friend who wrote a book for them who the editor saw a short story that she had published and loved it and asked her if she you know, would consider sending in a pitch. And um, Aconite, who is the one who publishes the book, these books for Marvel, they, you can go to their website and there's a place where you can submit a writing sample. So, and there's- But to do that, you would need to give them a detailed outline? Not initially, um, not for like, not for like the Aconite thing where they're just asking for a writing sample. Okay. Um, I think for them, they want to uh, writing uh, resume and a writing sample. So. Most companies that do licensed publishing, I have worked in that field for a long time, um, want to see your writing. They want to know that you have finished a book and to show them that you can finish a book. So ideally they're looking for published people, but not always. They'll, they'll take on published people if they think they see a lot of promise there. Um, and if you have a track record in a certain genre or a certain area, they might come to you. We also have a, an organization, an international association for media time writers, um, with well, time writers, and um, we keep they keep a list of all of our information, and publishers will contact them. Hmm. There's a book called Tied In that's, a, that's pretty old. It's pretty old, but it's still mostly valid. It's information about the media time writing business and how to, how to break in and how to, how to survive, that kind of thing. Yes. <laughs> Jeff, knowing that you've written a lot across a lot of genres, what would you say are some of the most important elements that are universal across all of the genres? And then everybody can chime in. <clears throat> you know, the, the same things that should be in every book of characters that you can care about, what happens to them. Um, characters with a goal, characters who are having a hard time reaching that goal, some force, whether it's a person or element that's preventing them from reaching their goal. But characters are the main thing that keep people reading. I agree. It's characters. You have to be able to write characters well and consistent. You know, they're not going to just change their nature all of a sudden. They, they, you build a person in your mind, and that's that's if you make them the right kind of person, people want to read it. I have a friend. Just to, total aside. I have a friend who just finished a novel, and was doing his proofreading and discovered that his one character was Millie half the time and Molly half the time. Oops. And I said, okay, she's indecisive. It's <laughs> <laughs> your secret twin. I think characters, for sure. There are some genres, I think there are other aspects that are also very important. Um, Fantasy and science fiction, in particular, I think world world building is very important. Um, things like thrillers and mysteries, plotting can be more important. Not to say that plotting is not important in any of the others, obviously, but you can often go at a slower pace with an epic fantasy than you can with a thriller or you know, a murder mystery. Bodies are dropping every other page, or something like that. So, there are certain certain things that might get emphasized more in one genre over the other. But I think character should hopefully be one thing that carries across no matter what the genre is. At least because otherwise you don't care about the book, and it's like I've started books, and it's like I'm not reading this. 
Yeah. I think there's, but I, I will say that there's there's flavors for everybody, right? There's the bee tree for somebody who just wants a bee tree. There's rom straight up romance for somebody who just wants a straight up romance. Thrillers that maybe don't have a lot of character or character development in them, but it's got that gripping plot and that danger that, that people, that somebody might look for. Honestly, the, you know, everybody's got their own. I am not a Stephen King fan. You can boo me if you want to. Um, people love Stephen King. I do not love Stephen King. I don't like his structure. I, I don't care much for horror anyway, or especially not graphic horror. But for me, Stephen King is like getting on the roller coaster, and instead of getting like a ride like this, all you get is this long, 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 <laughs> long, long, all and then it's done. And it's like, <laughs> I don't, I don't love that. So, but there are plenty of people who do. There, there are flavors for everybody. But I do believe that for me, character, character is key. It's a critical element in a book for me. You know, I would agree with all of you when I read books that character is the big thing. But then I read Colleen Hoover, and I, I, I've been studying Colleen Hoover. Just because I, I'm going, what? How in the heck do you have eight out of ten New York Times bestsellers? Right? I'm trying to figure her out. Right? And you read her characters; they're bland. How in the world does she sell? Because not everyone has a high enough IQ to enjoy science fiction. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but that is my opinion. I think that I, if you read science fiction and fantasy in your able to open your mind and you're able to follow it along, I think that you have a higher intelligence. And I think that some people just don't want to work. Somebody I mean, in the panel, one of the previous panels was talking kind of about this sort of thing. And they said with a bland character, that gives the reader the opportunity to insert themselves into, into that, that character. And so they I was become, making that comment. They, they become that, that hero, okay. So that I'm not black. Why would I picture myself as black? No, I, I was the guy in the back. I, I, yeah. okay. I won't read it. I won't read it. With respect to character, which we all kind of agree on, do you find that particular genres demand particular types of characters? And I think one of the ways you cross genres is to take that character who might belong in romance and shift him or her into horror. And me, you see what I'm getting at? I, I think that if you're going to adhere strictly to certain types of genre thrillers, like most whatever, there's a certain type of character that that demands. That is a thing where a book called Post Apocalyptic Horror is where you've got started out with normal people living their normal lives put into this world and they've survived or they are surviving and they've had to become the action hero to survive. So yeah, that, that would work. I think for me, if, if, I, if I hear what you're saying, for me, it's more about making sure that no matter who the character is, that they have the goals and motivations that are accessible and understandable and relatable and that they have enough glue, motivation, to stick the landing. And I, I, I think that, that any story requires that. I don't think, to me, I, I'm not quite, you know, to me characters are just, they're so realized. To me, they're just realized, so they're all individuals. I, I don't know that I could lift a character and just like drop them somewhere else and as if, you know, as if you're plucking a person out of their lives, but I suppose you could. I but I don't seen, know that that would have anything to do with the genre for me. I've seen like new books coming out that are like uh, the older lady, like a 90 year old lady is now on an adventure. And you know, it's because older people wanted to see, you know, how would that kind of play out? And it's taking her completely out of her nice cozy mystery world or whatever it is and saying, plop, here you are. No, go save the world or whatever. <laughs> uh, I mean, that would be kind of interesting. That would be kind of fun. Did you have a question? I did. Um, just really quick, though, that particular thing that the gentleman back there is talking about is essentially kind of like the Lord of the Rings. I mean, Bilbo and 
or the writers. That's the hero's journey, though. That's the that's the archetype of that. Is it's the hero's journey. You start out with a normal guy, has to go on this quest, save the girl, gets his mentor, he has help along the way. You know, things he has to overcome. I think that's kind of the archetype. I think that, I think he means something more like. Miss Marple is now in space. Right. 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 Or right. or you have your, you know, typical thriller action hero, you know, SEAL team guy who is thrust into a different role. I think we've seen like movies like The Tooth Fairy, do you remember that? Yes. Yeah. yeah exactly. Dwight Johnson? Where, right. Harden? With Dwight Johnson? Yeah. Okay, just making sure. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> like yeah, the tough action guy now has to be soft and nice and babysit mm -hmm. kids. Yeah, but that to me is not moving genre so much as it's moving. I mean, your your juxtapositioning, juxtapositioning. Excuse me. It's late, and I'm tired, and I peopled all last week. So. <laughs> um, I, I, we're not people; we're just writers. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's the irony, right? You're you're putting somebody in a position that's awkward for them, but isn't that isn't that what we do with almost all of our stories? We push them into a. We push them out of their normal world. Right. Fish out of water. Mm -hmm. Pardon? Fish out of water. Yeah, mm -hmm. fish out of water story is very common. Mm -hmm. So I do have a question. Yeah. Really quick. Um, so, what as a as a writer, almost no matter how long you've been doing it, um, if you're really really hip on mixing some different genres, but yet you see where the industry is going, like. Everybody's writing lit RPG, and that's really super popular. So that's what everybody needs to be doing, or some other genre that's really hot right now. And there are writers who say, "Well, if you write against what's popular, then you're never going to sell or whatever." But how important is it for you to stick with whatever kinds of genres or the mixing of genres that you want to do that goes against whether or not it sells because that's what you grew on. You just really want to write. I feel like a writer. To write this story only you can tell, right? Yeah. I, have I mean, you actually heard a writer say that if you don't follow the trend, you're never going to sell? Because that's that's against everything yes. I've always yeah. heard. Because because the publishing industry is like two yeah, years yeah. behind yeah. everything, yeah. and and also we keep hearing from agents and editors, I don't want another zombie story, and yet every time you turn around, there's another zombie yeah. story out <laughs> in the world, and you know it just is what it is. Um, if it's a good story and it's a well-told story, you'll find a home for it. Um, and nobody's got a nobody's got a crystal ball. Nobody's got a magic eight ball that says, "Oh yes, you know Marcy's next book would be." The book. What's that guy's name? Hugh, somebody who wrote Wool. Hugh oh, Howie. That's his name. Hugh yeah. Howie. And that, that was just like the publishing industry's like, wait, wait, what? what? You can't. <laughs> and he did. There's another medium, but I mean, you talk about movies. You talk about. How much money they put into the, some of these movies? Right? But our stories being told again and again. Right, right, but but, yeah. but okay, they put a billion dollars into that disaster that was Rings of Power, I know. right? And, and and it's like if they could predict <coughs> what was what would sell, they don't even know, and they put a billion dollars. They just into put it. put money in things they think are a sure thing, and they're very sure. And they were wrong. <laughs> they were wrong, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to know, uh, now the publishing uh, industry, the there's a lot of the big houses have fallen. You know, over, seems like every year a big chunk of them go. Game of Thrones. So um, how, how is that influencing all this stuff? The publishing genre? People write what they want now. They just put it's it on It's a little Amazon. more open. It's like a, a minefield because you don't know what's going to be horrible. <laughs> you think, well, that sounds interesting, and then, oh no, this is really bad. There are, yeah, and there are a lot more small presses uh, cropping up that are doing things that the big trads won't do, that are, they're afraid to do, right, and so they don't more, want to take the risk. <coughs> you see a lot more small presses that are crop, crop, uh, cropping up now and doing, uh, doing a lot of publishing, and that is where we're seeing a lot of change. And industry. there's also the self-publishing. ton of self-publishing. A lot of independence. Hugh Howie is a great example of somebody who was very successful at it. He said, um, we want to publish your book. And he said, nope. 
I'm well, okay. actually, this way. he said no, and then uh, Kristen Nelson, a very, very wise agent, came to him and said, look, I'm going to get them to do, do you a solid. You're going to get to keep your ebooks where they are. We're, we're going to sell them print only, and then we're going to go and sell your world rights one at a time, every country. And he said, okay. And so she took them to New York, and they sold the print rights for a very pretty sign. Right. But, well, but she's she's a very savvy agent. Is it, is it hybrid? Publishing a whole thing, hybrid publishing, um, or is, hybrid power, uh, hybrid career strategy. Oh yeah, everybody's now. I mean, I don't know anybody who's not doing some kind of hybrid something. You know, as far as uh, self publishing or small press, trad press. I mean, a mix of things. I again, I've been studying Colleen Hoover because I've been. I did not know who Colleen Hoover was in May. <laughs> okay, and then I saw oh. Eight out of ten books, and so I'm like, "What in the heck is this woman doing?" Right? And, and one of the things that made her Colleen Hoover is that, uh, is I found out that she was she had gotten she she had gotten some traditional publishing deals, right? But she had retained in, interest. She had retained control over five of her twenty properties. And when one of the her, one of the big things that made her go boom during the pandemic was that she took her five books and she, and she made them free during the pandemic, right? Because all of her audience was really young. Her audience was like 15 to 27. That's true. You know what? Because when I was younger, I read things that I tried to reread and I'm just not interested well, anymore. Well, the thing was, is think what was happening when the pandemic starts and all of her, little, her audience were very young, right? They're all in school or they're just out of school. They don't have a job. But there's no way to know that that's but, but, gonna happen. There's grumpy cat. Oh, she she has grumpy cat all over. I mean, oh no, there's but, no way to know. But that what that's I'm saying is happen. she figured it out, and because she was mobile okay. enough. But how many other people have done that? I know authors who have done that. Didn't work for them. All they got was a bunch of free downloads, and nobody bought the rest of the books. So, um, and they're good books. So. It, well, something you know, she did catch it's something. Or did she should just be comfortable and read it. You know what? I, as an author, I think that it's really important to know why we do what we do. Know your why. If you're doing this to get rich overnight, <laughs> buy a lottery ticket and a margarita. You'll be so much happier. <laughs> so much happier. But if you know, if you're doing this for uh, any other reason, self satisfaction for me, it's to connect with readers in a way that books have been <laughs> connected with me. And that is the most satisfying thing. And so when I get a fan who comes up to me and they, they're gushing about my newest book or they want to talk about the things they saw in my newest book or they want to explore with me something about a character or they just walk up and go, that woman in that book, I hated her. And I'm like, yeah, yes. me too. <laughs> me too. That makes me happy. That's what fulfills me. So if you're doing this to make a million dollars overnight, Lottery ticket, margarita, whatever your flavor is of drink that you well, prefer, that's the way to go. But if you have a deeper reason, if you know your why, then this is a place to be. This is what we do, right? No, I, I a, a big part of what happened in publishing we were talking about was the disappearance of the midlist. Um, mass market paperbacks, midlist, they used to, publishers used to be able to throw a few thousand dollars at a bunch of writers put out a bunch of books, didn't cost them much. They were so cheap to publish that when, when a bookstore would turn them, they'd strip off the cover and send back the covers and destroy the insides. And that went away. No longer was it, for some reason, a functional model. And all those of us who would be mid-list writers, and like, I love having mass market paperbacks out there, um, but I don't any that. They almost don't exist. You can't buy any books. No. Um, so there is no mid list. There's, there's the big bestsellers, and there's real niche stuff, and then there's hybrid publishing and small presses and self publishing. That's, what, that's why we go to conventions, is to find those books we wanted to read that we can't find anymore. Yeah, to your point, you were asking what the conglomeration of all the big houses is affecting. Um, it does mean that it's much, much harder to get traditionally published with those houses. That's what I've been reading. That I, I was reading a. I'm trying to get a book. Books. 
I wrote a book and I'm trying to get a traditional publishing deal. Hey. And I realized, and then they kept saying, and what I found out, they what I read, right? They said that there are well, there's fewer book deals out, but see, you know, the ones that do get deals, you get bigger advances. That's not true either. So it's, that is not necessarily Okay, no, no, no. Well, I, there, I was, there are I was a lot of people getting, from, especially first time authors who are getting pinged with very small advances right. because they don't know what's going to happen with that book. And again, they, they'll pick something like whatever they think is going to hit and they'll throw a bunch of money at it. And guess what? There's a certain level of self-fulfilling prophecy when you give an author a big advance and then you go, oh, now we gotta make our money back, so now we gotta take a bunch of marketing money, we gotta throw that no, money no, no, back. No. And then there's this self-fulfilling prophecy, but there are a whole lot of people who are walking in the door getting very small advances on their first books because they don't think it's gonna be the next no, thing to, to slice bread. No, so, it's, it's interesting. Well, the, the person I read that from, this is a guy who has a track record of sure. getting, this is this was a guy who has a track record of getting, plucking some guy, and his book gets a big advance, and then it sells because he apparently knows yeah. the sort of people who can get those sort of, Deals and then because he's book done from book. the bookstores and because he's done that before, he's got a track record. And it, it, it. Yeah. Is that true yeah. though that publishers now they're they, they're running out of money? They don't have a lot of money. A lot of them are going out of business. You don't get the things you used to get. Like they don't coddle you. They don't edit you. They don't. It's probably do get a cover, but it has it has to be their cover. They don't get they don't give you promotion more than a certain I've been small amount. By traditional publisher since nineteen ninety nine. I've never been coddled. There's and, and, and oh, sure. so I mean, just like, wait, was that supposed to be coddled? <laughs> the, <laughs> there there be nice to me. There used to be provided yeah, their cover. Right. Well, but the whole there, there reason, used to be the yeah, whole author taken out to dinner and you know uh, taken to the spa and all that time back 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 in the day right. and that is yes there's less and less and less of the okay. of that and also editors are so overworked and underpaid themselves they don't have time and the energy and the bandwidth yeah. to do the editorial um, work that some of those famous editors with their famous writers used to do so you see those stories right. about about those relationships they don't have that time, so a lot of that shifted to agents uh, about, what, 10, 15 years ago? We saw a big shift where that shifted toward agents, so more agents were doing the editorial support for writers and things like that, and now that's shifted away from that as well, because agents are overworked and, <clears throat> um, and overwhelmed, and they don't have the time to do that kind of work, and so now, yes, for you to break into, to get an agent, to get a traditional deal, you had better make sure that your book is quality, that you've done everything that you possibly can. Get a book coach, get an editor, get, get a proof, somebody to read through it, get beta readers, whatever it is that it takes for you to get it in the best shape possible, especially if you're trying to break into the trads, because it's got to be good. But what is the benefit of a publisher if they don't do mm -hmm. the things they used to do? They, distribution. Yeah. I mean, the books it's the books distribution. Books and books and but isn't the aren't those going away? Isn't is it like Amazon a bigger? No. You'd be surprised at how many more small bookstores have cropped up in the last five years. There's it's a boom of huge. Yeah. Kind of bookstores and Chain. Now they I have heard that. that that's great. That's one yeah. thing. Because readers have become niche, right? Some, Some but but it, but there's just a wide open place for people who want to go to a bookstore, pick up a book, hold a book, smell a book, talk to somebody about a book. You know, help help me find a book. You know, there's there are these beautiful, wonderful independent bookstores cropping up all over the United States. And right authors now. that come in and you get to go see yeah. them, yeah. Yeah. all that. And the, the big advantage of traditional publishing is that they'll pay you up front. 
Yeah, traditional publishing, you get an advance on royalties. It's not, it's not necessarily, it's kind of gets yeah, upfront pay. And I always like to explain that it's an advance on your royalties that you would then have to earn out. And if you don't earn it out, then they're not really probably going to want another book from you. So getting a smaller advance when you're a first time author is probably not as bad a thing as you might think. And also, they used to pay advances out um, in two payments. Now they're stretching them out three and four payments a lot of times with authors. So you get um, on signing, it used to be on signing and on delivery, now it's on signing, then you get a partial on delivery, then you get a partial on, uh, when is it, when they finally um, finish editing, and then on another one when they actually launch the book. So so that, that big advance that you hear about, they're chunking it out now too. Well, yeah. and, and can they drop you at any time during that process? Well, if your editor goes away, you your deal can go away. Yeah, they can go away. Can kill them. Kill them. Kill well, that would be one of the advantages on their side. Yeah, they, there's typically a kill fee in your contract. I think we have one minute. One minute. One minute. One minute. <clears throat> have any of you done audiobooks? Yes. Um, That's my dream. Uh, I haven't like done them myself, but I've had audiobooks produced yeah. of my work. Yeah, I haven't done an audiobook. I, I'd like to, but um, so I, I do have books that are out on audio yeah. as well. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not a voice actor, so. No, I don't mean you personally. I mean, yeah. how, how does that get done? That's, that is my you have to hire someone if you're self-publishing, or your publisher does it. Mm -hmm. Your publisher does it. I have one that's a, <coughs> like a full cast yes, audio full cast acting audio. Yeah. Nice. My, my Superman book. Oh, Very nice. cool. How fun is that? Yeah. So we're out of time, but before we go, um, signing. Oh, yes, I do. Uh, say, I have books in the um, bookstore, and my signing is on Saturday from 3 to 4 p.m. Okay, we're. We don't yet have books in the bookstore. I don't know if we will, but we have, Jeff and I have a signing um, tomorrow from 4 to 5. That is also opposite from the poetry slam. So I will only be at my signing for about the first 10 minutes, and then I'm going to go over to the poetry slam. So if you want something signed and you miss me at the autograph, those come over to the poetry one, or you know, it's a small time. Don't do that. I'll have a place to go home. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Creative Play and Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, please check out D&D &D Journey of the 5th Edition and Ragnarok and roll a Scion Hero to Ragnarok Story. Also, check out our Patreon page for more content and behind-the-scenes things, as well as joining us for a one-shot game or two.